Hello, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about how we can stress test algorithms to ensure that we can trust them. You know, algorithms are increasingly important in our daily lives and history is filled with examples of how algorithms have led to huge disasters just from not being thoroughly stress tested. What you see there is a particularly graphic illustration of what can go wrong uh, with an algorithm, particularly when we haven't learnt to trust it or ha it hasn't earned our trust. Uh, that's a photo of my face where an algorithm has um, correctly estimated my age and got my gender correct. Uh, it then goes on to predict uh, personality characteristics, which started to concern me a little bit. Uh, and then finally, it suggests some rearrangements of the face, which would enhance beauty. Um, and that's where I really feel that this algorithm is completely untrustworthy, um, but we'll get there. Uh, what we're gonna do today is um, discuss a particular application. I'm gonna revisit a study that I did in 2007 on facial age estimation. So taking a photo of someone's face and estimating how old they are. Uh, we developed an algorithm back in 2007. Um, I'm going to present the algorithm and the experimental results and the conclusions which were published in this paper in 2007. Uh, the paper has attracted around a thousand citations by now. Um, it was a good paper where we showed our algorithm was better than everybody else's algorithms on the, the standard benchmark data sets that everybody's supposed to use. But I now want to revisit this study over a decade later in light of um, a new methodology that we've developed for stress testing algorithms. And when I apply this instant space analysis methodology to this problem, uh, we have the opportunity to ask whether the conclusions that we had back in 2007 still hold up. Did we thoroughly stress test the algorithm as well as we could have? And are our conclusions still valid? So that's what we're going to do. So we'll start by uh, talking about facial age estimation and I'll present the algorithm and the results and then we'll revisit. So uh, facial age estimation, why do we want to be able to estimate how old someone is based on their face? Well, it's not just about being able to um, reveal secrets that people don't necessarily want you to, to, to know. Um, there are plenty of practical applications for why we might want to do this. And so basically we're working in the field where we take images, we detect if there's a face, if the face exists, we do some pre-processing of the data, we analyze the face uh, to extract some knowledge from it. Uh, so that may be the age, that's what we're concerned about today. Uh, you might be trying to recognize who the person is, do an identity match. You might be looking at their facial expressions some automated anal analysis of whether the person looks agitated or um, through video surveillance, if you can, uh, try to understand a little bit more about their emotions. And of course, you can fuse all of this with other biometrics to get more accuracy. Uh, but that's what we're looking at is age estimation from a face. Uh, and so well over a decade ago, I started looking at this topic um, with my former student, Xin Geng, um, now in China. Uh, it was an exciting research topic at that point. It was fairly new. Uh, there were some existing methods that had been proposed, but there was plenty of room for improvement. Uh, we saw immediately many important applications, um, and it wasn't just a neat party trick of being able to guess how old someone is. Um, there are significant applications that I'll talk about soon. It was really interesting and quite challenging. So you've got the task of, you might have some photos of one person at various stages through their life. Uh, and the challenge is, can we actually learn what happens to the face as somebody gets older digitally, can we learn that? Uh, so that we then have a model that we can use for estimating how old a given face is. Uh, so it's quite challenging and important. Um, to convince you that it's actually difficult, uh, can I just say that humans are not very good at this task? So if I had a room full of people in front of me, if we weren't in isolation, um, I would ask you all how old you think this person is. And I would hear a very wide range of perspectives. Um, I would hear everything from late teens through to some people thinking he's in his 40s. There's a huge uh, variance. Um, so you can pause now and think how old you think this person is. And let me now just reveal to you that he's 19. Uh, and this person here, um, again, there would be a huge range of opinion. Um, she looks kind of a little bit miserable, so you'd think she's a bit older. Um, she's actually 49. And if I asked you how, how old this little fella is, um, those of you who are parents would probably be quite accurate. 
um, because our ability to do this task very much depends on our experience uh, and we tend to be better at estimating how old people are from our own culture as well. But most of you would recognise that that's a child. Um, so I think the standard deviation of responses would be narrower. Um, but if you thought that he was five, you would be accurate. Nevertheless, uh, if I had an audience here, you would believe me that this is actually quite difficult for humans to get right. So why is it such an important research topic then? Um, well, there's plenty of reasons why people are interested in being able to accurately estimate the age of somebody. Some of the obvious ones are just to enhance human computer interaction. So that if you know that it's an elderly person, for instance, that's interacting with an information kiosk, you might use a larger font size or, or something, um, or use a language that's appropriate to a child. Um, there's age specific access control where you might want to have um, a vending machine, for instance, that only dispenses um, alcohol or cigarettes to adults. Uh, you might want to fuse it with other biometrics such as fingerprint or iris um, to improve accuracy for um, identification purposes. Uh, and also law enforcement has, has plenty of applications for this in terms of missing, missing persons, um, aging um, children that are missing or um, providing age estimates for victims or suspects. So plenty of important applications. It's not just a, a nice party trick. Uh, and here's an example, of course, in Japan, uh, many years ago now, they introduced these uh, cigarette vending machines um, that considers, according to their marketing material, um, it looks at over 100,000 people's faces and analyzes bone structure and skin sag and brow wrinkles and crow's feet um, in order to identify whether or not you're an adult or a child. Um, but of course, people have already tricked it by holding up a photo of somebody else and it still gives them um, the cigarettes. Um, in the end, I guess Fujitaka is, um, is a business trying to make money, so accuracy is probably um, not critical for them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if only it was as simple as cutting open a tree and reading the rings. Um, there's a lot of mystery to the face, um, but I think, um, you know, the, the numbers can be analysed and we can develop algorithms that can fairly accurately estimate your age. So research started in this field around 2002 when the first database became available. So people very generously, painstakingly collected uh, the data. Um, this was the European Working Group on Facial and um, Gesture Recognition. So they had over a thousand faces coming from 82 different people where each person had between six and 18 images throughout their life. Uh, they were ranging in age from babies through to 69. Uh, and you can see from the photos, there's many variations in uh, lighting, uh, in the pose, uh, the expressions, whether or not they've got beards or hats or, or glasses. Uh, these are not your standard passport photo, look straight ahead, do not smile. These are a little bit more natural. So we need algorithms that can still work despite these natural variations. So how do we actually convert an image into numbers so that we can feed it into some kind of algorithm? So we start by taking the face and we identify um, landmark points. These are critical points that everybody shares. They're important points that define the geometry of the face. So there's a set of, I think, 68 points that critically define the geometry of a face. Uh, those points then get uh, stretched through Procrustes analysis to take on the um, location of the average face. So for each individual face, we know their unique geometry. We can then stretch them to take on the face of Mr. or Ms. average. And then we can read off from that average face um, the unique uh, illumination, the light and shade of, of the face, the texture. Um, so we have a person who has their unique geometry, we extract the points, we stretch them so they take on the average face and then we read off the light intensity through raster scan. So we end up with a shape vector, X, S, and we end up with a texture ve vector, X, T. So we concatenate the shape and texture vectors into a great big long vector. And then for each face we have, we just line those up in columns and we have this giant matrix. 
uh, containing the data for all the faces in our training data set. We then use principal component analysis to summarize every face as just 200 um, dimensions. So PCA is used to project this very high dimensional um, vector into a 200 dimensional um, dimension reduced uh, feature vector. Uh, to do that, we subtract off the mean. Uh, so we, we mean center the data. We calculate the covariance matrix, uh, which is real and symmetric, so it can be diagonalized. And then we do eigen decomposition of that covariance matrix, where the covariance matrix um, can not only be expressed as the product of these matrices, but also as the sum of these uh, low ranked matrices. Uh, and if we concatenate the sum at some uh, value k, so we just take the top k eigenvalues, so these are sorted from largest through to smallest, then we're just dropping off the insignificant ones at the end and we end up with a reduced dimensionality. So we consider k equals 200, we only take the top 200 um, eigenvalues um, and we define a face according to those um, top 200 eigenvectors uh, and that's our dimension reduction. So these define a new coordinate system in 200 dimensional space um, that explains most of the variation that we see in the collection of photos that we have. So we then project the data onto these top 200 principal components. So a facial feature vector X is transformed to a new point B in that 200 dimensional space using this linear transformation. Uh, and we, of course, we can go back again. Right? So um, that vector B in 200 dimensions gives us the coordinates of the face in the 200 dimensional space. So every face is now defined by a unique 200 dimensional feature vector. And we have compressed the data without losing too much. Um, good thing about PCA is that we can measure what we have lost as the sum of the remaining eigenvalues and it is typically small. So uh, that's now B is the vector of face model parameters that we use to summarize a face. Um, and all of this is standard uh, facial image analysis techniques um, from Edwards et al. in 1998. So then based on that approach of taking facial images and summarizing them as 200 dimensional feature vectors, we have the first age estimation algorithm that was developed by Lanitas et al. in 2002. Uh, and it's a very simple quadratic function. It's a quadratic fit to that vector of uh, face model parameters. Uh, it's trained the, the quadratic coefficients for every person. The three um, coefficients of a quadratic are fitted using a genetic algorithm. Uh, and then uh, the technique is a weighted appearance specific model um, where for an unseen face, uh, it calculates um, the, the nearest distance um, to those existing training data images uh, and weights according to those distances. So that's a very simple method based on a quadratic function. A couple of years later, that team uh, came up with some improvements. They started looking at hierarchical structures where they would take the face parameter, the vector B, they would come up with a, a rough age estimate to then feed into some more refined. So they'd identify if it's an adult or a child and then they'd have separate models for each of those, um, those classes. Uh, then they also did some clustering, an approach where they cluster first and they have a different age estimator for different clusters. So that's just fine tuning the parameters for different, more homogeneous groups. Finally, the um, age and appearance and age specific age estimator, facial parameters in, do some clustering, uh, do a classifier uh, for selected clusters. And then, um, yeah, in the end, it's just a sequence of increasingly um, refined approaches. So we've got the quadratic in 2002 and we've got these sort of hierarchical approaches in 2004. So that was the existing uh, algorithms that were available when we started looking at this research. So the approach we took um, was a little bit different. So looking at the characteristics of facial aging, we have to acknowledge the sad truth that the aging process is uncontrollable, uh, it's slow and it's irreversible. Uh, which means algorithmically that the collection of data is very time consuming and laborious. And if you've missed a photo of someone at a certain point in their, in their life, you can't go back and get one that doesn't exist. We, ha we just have the data we have. Okay, so the available training data is a small set of highly incomplete aging patterns. We have to work around that. 
Another characteristic of the ageing process is that different people age in different ways, if, uh, as much determined by genetics and, and lifestyle factors. And the consequence of that is that the mapping from the features, what your face um, data tells us, to what your true age is, is not unique. You know, you could have two people that have the same face um, that happen to be similar faces that happen to be different ages. Um, and likewise, you could have people who are the same age that have completely different faces. So that tells us that probably some machine learning kind of techniques are going to get quite confused by this scenario. Uh, finally, the ageing patterns are actually temporal data. Um, every age has a unique rank in some kind of time series. Um, and so this is something we can exploit and something that the other methods weren't using. They weren't really exploiting the fact that we know that this person at this age and this person at this age are the same person, right? So our approach um, was using exploiting this information. So in 2007, we proposed an approach where we're not just modeling the, um, the age of a given image, we're modeling the aging process. So we collect all the images of the same person at different stages throughout their life where we have them and acknowledge the missing gaps where we don't have that information. Uh, and we extract all of the B vectors, the 200 dimensional B vectors for the faces that we have. So we have a feature extractor. And so when the person is between zero and one, it might be missing, then missing. But be when they're aged between one and two, we have their B vector and then missing, missing, but when they're five, we have their B vector. Missing, missing, when they're eight, we have the B vector. And so if we take that concatenated vector, filled with missing values, but also populated with data, and then we ask the question of how do we fill in those missing values so that we can actually see the aging pattern of a person across their life, and then we have the aging pattern of many people, and can we learn what aging actually looks like? It's a different approach quite a powerful approach as you will see from the experimental results. So our goal then is to find a representative subspace for the aging patterns that enables us to handle this missing data problem. So the basic data imputation concept here is that we have uh, different people. Uh, we have photos of them at certain ages, but not all ages. But across all our people, we might have enough knowledge of what a four-year-old looks like or a 10-year-old looks like. Um, so that's the data that we have. And in order to fill in the missing value, we might look at other people at the same age, and we might look at the same person at different ages, and we might combine that information somehow together to, um, to fill in the gaps. So our algorithm, which we called AGES, it's a bit try hard, stands for Aging Pattern Subspace, uh, is trying to learn a representative subspace for what aging truly looks like. If you take this vector, great big long vector of aging faces, we want to learn the subspace of where the truth lies, where, where that is real and true. And any other vector that doesn't represent a, a legitimate looking authentic aging process will not be on that subspace. The subspace is reserved, is learnt by the patterns that represent true aging based on the training data. Okay, so it's, a, so it's a linear algebra kind of approach. So we apply principal component analysis iteratively to fill in the gaps. So we initialize the missing values to the average face. It's a very rough start. So, so you've got you know, a baby and then one year later, they look like Mr. and Ms. Average and then maybe Mr. and Ms. Average again. And then two years later, we've got them as a four-year-old and then Mr. Ms. Average. And so it looks very strange to start with, but we're going to iteratively update those averages with more and more accurate information. So we have our aging patterns. We do principal component to um, project to a subspace. We then um, reconstruct and we take that back again. Uh, and then we ask whether or not um, there was an error. If the pattern lies on the subspace, when you project to the subspace and come back again, there will be very small movement. If the pattern was originally a long way off the subspace and you project to the subspace and then you come back again, um, then there's a, there's a huge error there that we're going to notice. Um, and so based on the accuracy of the reconstruction, um, we get information about um, how we can update the missing values 
we update the missing values to the mean of the reconstructed values and it improves things and, and it repeats and goes around until convergence. Um, the details of the proof of convergence are in the, the 2007 paper that we published. So this is the, the result. The dotted outline images were originally missing. Uh, we used the ones that had no outline to train the subspace. Uh, and then we fill in the gaps. The dotted images are reconstructed. And I think you'll agree that there's no Mr. Ms. average here. The, the dotted outline images do look like they belong to a continuous sequence of aging. Um, so that's satisfying. Um, the method works. And then how do we use it for estimating the age of a, a single person, a, a new face? So we have a test image. And what we do is we say, okay, well, if this person was one, they would lie here. If they were two, they would lie here. If they were 69, they would lie here. So we place them in a position within the aging pattern vector. We try all of the opportunities. We then take each of those and we project onto the pattern, the aging pattern subspace that we've learned, and we reconstruct again. And we look at the difference of the before and after. And we look at that face and say, well, they were supposed to be between zero and one. When I project and reconstruct, they now look like this. Is that the same face? No, it's not the same face. There's an error there. What about this one? If I think that they're 69 and I put them at the end of the aging pattern, when I project and reconstruct, they look like this. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but that looks like an alien that's completely warped. It doesn't even look human anymore. So there's a huge error with that one. It's not believable. The one that's the most believable is when I put them in the second position. So this is saying they're between one and two. When I project and reconstruct, the face has retained uh, what it originally looked like. That's the truth. There's the smallest error there. So we take the one that has the smallest reconstruction error as our estimate of where they belong in the sequence. What is the truth of where that face fits in the learnt um, ageing pattern? So when we apply this approach um, to the standard benchmark data sets in the literature, to the FGNet ageing database, for instance, this is what I showed you before, over a thousand images from 82 different people with all the variations. And we use 200 principal components um, to summarise each face. And this represents around 95% of the variation in the data that is retained through this dimension reduction. We also apply the algorithm to another database. This is called the MORPH database. Um, not exactly sure where these photos came from. I'm pretty sure they, they look like criminals. Um, they're all uh, adults and they look very unhappy. And there's around three images per person. Um, again, variations. So we have our two databases that we've tested on. So one's got about 1,000 images, one's got about 1,700 images. So it's a, it's a significant amount of data that we've tested our algorithm on. Um, You'll see later in the talk that um, you know there's potentially some bias here, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, well, here's some bias. We're only using 433 images of um, people of Caucasian descent as the test set. Um, so there's some bias, uh, but that's what people did in in the literature. So. The methods we're comparing are our ages method and a little variation where we improved it a little bit by using some linear discriminant analysis as well. That was the published method in 2007. We compare it to the 2002 algorithm and the 2004 algorithm. We also compare it to standard machine learning approaches where you would just take a face and say, this person's 19. Here's another face, this person's 27. Here's another face, this person's 73. Learn the relationship between the 200 dimensional feature vector and the actual age. And we use four different machine learning techniques on that standard classification um, or, or prediction problem. In addition, we compare our results to humans. Now, I already mentioned that humans find this quite a challenging task, but we compare our results to human observers. The group A were given exactly the same data as our algorithms. So I should say that our algorithms are only given tightly cropped black and white images of the face from which the 200 dimensional feature vector is extracted. So group A were given exactly the same data that the algorithms were given. Group B had an advantage. They were given full color images that included hair and ears and clothing and, and things like that. So they should be more accurate. 
than, than human group A. So that's our experimental setup. The results, we record the mean um, absolute error for all the algorithms and the humans as the difference in true age versus predicted age um, averaged across all of the data. And what we find is that our method ages, well, in particular ages LDA, which was our improvement, has the smallest mean absolute error compared to the existing methods. So we got 6.2 years error on average compared to eight or 14. And then all the machine learning methods were um, giving greater errors than our method. And even the humans. So the human group A, given the same information as the algorithm, got an error of eight, we're getting 6.22. And human group B that had that advantage because they could see more, more detail, um, their error was about the same as our algorithm working on less data, less information. Uh, on the uh, morph data set, um, slightly worse errors um, for everybody, but in the end, ages LDA is still better than everybody else. Okay, so all of that detail is in our published paper. Uh, the conclusion of that published paper was our method is best. This is what happens when we write papers, right? We develop an algorithm, we test it on the benchmark data sets, we compare our results to other people's results. And if our method is demonstrably better on average across a well-studied big data set, we will with pride submit our paper to be published and the reviewing process will uh, agree that we have rigorously stress tested the algorithm by using a well-studied large data set and reporting on average and showing that we are better. So our method got the smallest average errors. Uh, it was even more accurate than humans. Um, it's certainly worthy of publishing and it got published in the top uh, journal in the field and uh, it's become quite highly cited this work. Other neat tricks you can do with it um, is forward and backward age estimation. So for instance, you can take a face and you can say, here's a boy at four. What is he gonna look like when he's 31? Um, this is the truth in the bottom row of what he looks like when he's 31. The middle image is what our algorithm thought he would look like when he was 31. Our algorithm did not know that he would need glasses, but apart from that, um, there's some similarity. You'd think he is at least his brother. Um, this, this girl here at the age of three, what's she going to look like when she's 18? You just take this face, you um, pass it through the algorithm and you read off what it looks like in the 18th spot. Uh, this is what she actually looked like. This is what we think she should look like, pretty close. And you can go backwards as well. So at the end here, we have an 18 year old. We say, what did he look like when he was between zero and one? That's what he actually looked like. That's what our algorithm predicted. It's pretty good. Okay, so nice algorithm, well tested, published. Conclusions are our algorithm performs remarkably better than the state of the art algorithms, and it's even better than humans. It's a nice application of some fairly simple linear algebra. Um, and there were some more sophisticated maths that we did over the coming years. You know, so we looked at multilinear subspaces with tensor analysis, we fused with other biometrics like voice data. Um, and all of these improvements, uh, we looked at alternatives to principal component analysis for filling in the missing values. All of these improvements helped to reduce the errors even further. We got the mean absolute error down to about 5.36 years, uh, then dropped even further by fusing with, vo uh, with voice data. And so that was all great. Um, we got lots of media coverage at that time, around 2007. Um, I gave talks on, on this topic. Um, we had interviews. I, I did a radio interview in Cambridge, a, a radio show called The Naked Scientist, where they sent me photos of the radio host, Chris, and the people who worked in the, the back office, the tech guys and Mira um, was an admin assistant. And they sent their photos. And then during the interview, live on air reveal, um, they opened up the envelope to reveal what our algorithm thought in terms of how old they were. We were very, very accurate uh, for Chris and Dave and Ben, um, but unfortunately, poor Mira, our algorithm was horribly inaccurate with her. Um, I think our algorithm thought she was in her 30s and she was about 19. 
So then the rest of the interview just turned into a big discussion about why our algorithm was racist because Mira was from Sri Lanka and why was our, our, our algorithm unable to accurately estimate the age of this Sri Lankan young woman. Uh, and of course, our algorithm is not racist, um, it's just ignorant, which admittedly is pretty much the same thing. Um, our algorithm had only been exposed to Caucasian data and it was quite accurate on that, um, but had very limited experience with any other kinds of faces. So, um, of course, algorithmic trust and bi bias in algorithms is a huge topic now. Um, and there's been lots of media attention about algorithms that are racist or, or people being arrested because an algorithm inaccurately thought that they were a criminal. Um, and it turns out that minority groups are particularly at risk for having algorithms perform very poorly on them. So uh, it's become a huge topic. I moved away. Um, we knew this paper got, you know, it's got around a thousand citations now. We knew that there was lots of um, work still going on, but I moved away onto other topics. So did my co-authors. Um, and it wasn't until late 2018 that I kind of got dragged back into it. And I was at the University of Melbourne at an alumni event where we had um, a thing called uh, the Science Gallery. And there was a, an exhibition called The Biometric Mirror. And this is where people would go into this photo booth and it would take a photo of your face and it would analyze, the algorithm would analyze your face. And so um, it says down here, when someone stands in front of biometric mirror, the system detects a range of facial characteristics in seconds. It then compares the user's data to that of thousands of facial photos, which were evaluated for their psychometrics by a group of crowdsourced responders. So basically it will analyze your face. It will estimate your age and gender but it will use crowdsourced information to predict what people are likely to think about your face in terms of your personality. Um, the, the people behind this exhibition uh, did this biometric mirror to provoke um, questions around the ethical use of artificial intelligence. The fact that it's very easy to implement artificial intelligence that discriminates or is unethical um, and what the societal consequences are for that. Uh, and certainly that night, while I was manning the booth and, and helping the alumni understand the mathematics behind facial image analysis, um, it became very clear that a lot of people were very concerned about the potential for this kind of algorithm to be giving too much information to people maybe landing in the wrong hands. Um, and like, for instance, an employer, that believes because of your face and what an algorithm says that you're irresponsible or untrustworthy. Um, and it's really important that we understand whether this algorithm can be trusted. So how is it tested? Of course, at the end of the night, um, when all the alumni had gone home, um, curiosity killed the cat and I had to get in that booth and just see what it thought. So that was my face um, before the algorithm messed around with it too much. It does, I'll admit, it does look a bit strange. Um, I was a bit stunned. Uh, I'll, I'll say no more. But um, the algorithm said that I was a 45 year old female, which was fairly accurate, got the female right. It, the 45 year old was fairly accurate, close enough, um, that I started to think, oh yeah, this algorithm's pretty good. It then analyzed my personality. So I don't know if you can see these bar charts down here, but. Um, it analyzed my personality and decided that I was an introvert, that I was kind, I was happy, but I was irresponsible. That's what people would think when they look at my face. Now, I may have had a glass of wine or two that night. Maybe that was the, um, the reason for the irresponsible. I'm not sure how, how accurate the algorithm is with these kinds of things. But it is just summarizing what crowdsourced people think. So that was just a bit of fun. And all the alumni all night found that a bit of fun. Um, but then it does this thing called the Marquardt mask. So Dr. Marquardt is a plastic surgeon in California um, who works along this theory of the golden ratio proportions of the face. And so throughout history, there have been many beautiful people like Marilyn Monroe or Queen Nefertiti that apparently had um, golden ratio proportions to certain dimensions of their face. So Dr. Marquardt has this mask that he applies over your face 
to show how your face should probably be changed if you wanted to have these golden ratio proportions that are associated with beauty. So that's my face with the overlay of the Marquardt mask. And then it stretches your face and changes it um, so that you can appear to be algorithmically beautiful. So here we go. That's um, apparently what an algorithm believes beauty is for me. Um, everybody that night did look like an alien, I have to say. Um, so apparently aliens must have golden ratio proportions. But anyway, the after, apart from we may disagree about what beauty looks like, um, in terms of personality, so it still felt that I was a 45 year old female, um, but the algorithm now predicted that people would believe that I was less happy and less kind. Well, I'm not very happy looking like an alien. Um, less aggressive. Uh, I'm now an extrovert. I'm more responsible, uh, but also 100% weird. Uh, crowdsource people would be united in believing that I was weird. Okay, so that's uh, what happens when we um, give an algorithm our face. And so we have to ask, um, should we trust any of this? It's all just a bit of fun, but there are some algorithms out there that are not for fun. They're quite serious and we need to understand how we develop trust in algorithms. So, you know, with our 2007 facial age estimation study, we tested it on a lot of faces. Does that mean we should trust it? How do we establish trust in an algorithm? So this is the typical way we do it. We select some test instances. We report statistics such as the mean standard deviation of some chosen performance metric. If that performance metric is um, acceptable or if it's better on average than some competing algorithms, then we will typically draw the conclusion that the algorithm is good. Please publish my paper. How often though do we stop and defend our choice of test instances? It's like, I chose these test instances because everybody else uses them, right? So I inherit them from a website. And so this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what the editors of the journal would expect me to do. But we need to look at those test instances and we need to ask questions about whether they are biased, whether they're sufficiently diverse, whether they um, support the, the broadest conclusions. There's also the no free lunch theorem that we have to consider, which basically um, leads us to believe that there's no one algorithm that's going to be best all the time for all possible test instances, right? Every algorithm has something that it is exploiting. Um, and if you give it test instances that have those properties, then yeah, it's going to do well. But if you give it other instances where there's no opportunity for it to show what it can do to shine, then it might just look like every other algorithm. Uh, the other problem I have is that um, this practice we have of taking a bunch of test instances and reporting on average how different algorithms perform across this collection. Averages hide all sorts of sins. What we really need is a, a way of cracking open that collection of test instances and being able to see this algorithm is good for these kinds of instances and not good for these kinds of instances instead of hiding everything with an on average. So on the subject of trusting algorithms, um, the problem with reporting on average um, performance is that it limits our understanding of the unique strengths and weaknesses of algorithms. Um, we can't easily identify particular instances to which an algorithm is well suited or unreliable. And in the end, the choice of test instances is really critical and deserves a lot more attention than it gets. Um, the reporting of on average performance doesn't help us to scrutinize if those test instances have the essential properties that are going to support the strongest conclusions. And by those properties, I mean, we need to be able to demonstrate that instances are diverse, unbiased, they're challenging, they're discriminating, they help us see which algorithms are well suited. They don't have all algorithms performing the same across all the instances. Um, and we also need to look at real world like instances and real world instances of where they are. So uh, a more rigorous approach to stress testing um, then is to move away from on average performance. And um, I'm gonna tell you now about instance space analysis just briefly, and then we're gonna apply it to the 2007 study. So 
we have been developing instant space analysis, which helps create a visualization of the whole space occupied by all possible test instances, not just the ones that you have on your computer or the benchmarks that you've inherited from other people, but what is the mathematical boundary of the space in which all possible test instances could theoretically lie? What is the mathematical boundary of that space? And then where in that space do you have instances? And how do your algorithms perform on those instances? So in order to do this, we summarize every instance as a point in some high dimensional feature space, and we then project to 2D. And we get the boundary of that space using the upper and lower bounds of those features. Now these features are critical mathematical statistical properties of the instances that correlate with difficulty. So I'll call them difficulty metrics. Um, they help us distinguish between similar and different instances of the problem and these difficulty metrics help us understand the performance of algorithms. Uh, they correlate. So we, we come up with some features that we want to measure that help us summarize the instances, a great big long feature vector and then we then project to 2D so we can see the space. Uh, in that 2D instance space, we inspect the performance of algorithms across the space. We can see which algorithms perform well or poorly across the space. We look at the distribution of features so we can say, ah, over here, there are instances where this algorithm does particularly well. And those instances are characterized by particularly high values of this feature or a low value of this feature. And we can describe what the instances are that algorithms are well suited to or poorly suited to. This will give us insights into how the instance properties affect algorithms and is a lot more insightful than just summarizing on average how an algorithm performs. Uh, within this space, we use machine learning techniques to predict performance so we can kind of carve up uh, regions of the space and predict what will happen, not just for the instances that we know what happens where we have empirical evidence, but beyond that to the parts of the space where we have no evidence yet because the instances don't exist. Um, it also offers us the opportunity to generate new instances in a controlled manner. So the instance space methodology then, instance space analysis, um, helps us visualize the distribution and the diversity of test instances. So we know for sure we're cracking open that set of test instances and we can see what we've got. Um, we can define the boundary where test instances can theoretically exist and we can assess the adequacy of existing benchmarks. Are they biased? Are they only in a certain region? Do we have good coverage across all the possible future scenarios we might need to consider? That's how we'll develop trust in algorithms. We can define the region of the area where an algorithm is predicted to perform well, and I call that its footprint. The algorithm has a footprint over here where it's predicted to perform well, and we can quantify the, the area of that region as some objective measure of the power of an algorithm. If your algorithm has a larger footprint than some other algorithm, it's better. If your algorithm has a footprint um, that's over some particular real world instances then no other, and no other algorithm is there, then it's better. Okay, so you can define um, what you mean by good performance and you can quantify it objectively. We can qualitatively describe um, the features of instances that lead to good or poor performance and explain strengths and weaknesses of algorithms. We can do automated algorithm selection in this space. We can say, if your instance lies over here, this is the method you should use. This is what's predicted to perform well. Uh, and finally, we can identify areas of the instance space where we have no information. There's great big gaps and holes in this space where no instances exist at the moment, even though theoretically they can exist. Um, and so it gives us the motivation to um, generate new instances that live at certain unexplored locations of this space. So we've successfully applied instance space analysis to many problems um, in time series forecasting, where we've published the International Journal of Forecasting, uh, to machine learning algorithms, uh, lots of different optimization problems, um, graph coloring, timetabling, job scheduling, um, the knapsack, all sorts of things, and, and also continuous optimization, black box optimization problems. Uh, even software testing, um, we've applied instant space analysis to. If you go to matilda.unimelb.edu.au, you'll find our online tool 
Matilda stands for Melbourne Algorithm Test Instruments Library with Data Analytics. And it's the online tool that enables researchers to do their own instance space analysis to get insights into their own algorithms and problems. Uh, so here's the uh, website uh, for Matilda. Uh, and I encourage you to, um, to go there, create a user account uh, where you can download the code from GitHub and uh, create your own instance space if you want to stress test your algorithms. So now uh, quickly I'll, um, in the last 10 minutes, revisit that 2007 study on facial age estimation where we had our winning algorithm. The instances um, were 1,002 images from the FGNet database. The features, to create an instance space, we have to have features. What am I measuring about the faces? I'm just going to use the top 10 principal components, not even going to use the 200, just the top 10 principal components from that B vector that summarizes a face. For the algorithms, I'm just going to consider the top three algorithms based on absolute average, uh, absolute error in years. So um, this was the table we had in our 2007 paper where our algorithm um, got uh, an error of 5.54. Uh, we, we redid it recently. Um, and then the 2002 uh, existing method got an error of 8.06 and the support vector machine got 7.25. So we're just going to take those three best methods. The rest of them had worse errors. Okay, so how do I measure good performance? So instance based analysis requires me to say what good performance looks like, but you're free to choose your definition. I'm going to define the performance metric to be um, a good performance is the scaled relative error in predicted age compared to the known true age, right? So we take the predicted age minus the true age and we divide by the, um, the average error. So it compares the error of one algorithm relative to the average error of all algorithms. So my user-defined definition of good performance is you are good if your algorithm gets a Y value less than 0.5. In other words, your absolute error in age prediction is less than half the absolute error of all algorithms. If your error is less than half everyone else's error, I will say that is a good performance. But you're free to change your, your definition of good um, to whatever you like. So we create an instance space. Every instance is a point in a 10 dimensional feature space. We then project to 2D um, and we have our own dimension reduction technique that we've developed that solves a sort of global optimization problem. It's, it's not principal component analysis. We're projecting to 2D in a way that makes linear trends in the 2D space as obvious as possible. The reason I want linear trends in um, performance, so an easy end and a hard end, um, for instances and also features is to aid visual interpretation. Principal component analysis is just maximizing the variance retained. That's not what I want. What I want is an instance space that has uh, easy interpretability. So we've got our own optimization algorithm that does that. Um, details are in some of our papers, but in the end, this is the optimal projection matrix. We take, um, there's a feature selection stage. So we go from 10D to the six most informative features were selected as principal component three through to eight. And then those six dimensions get projected to two dimensions using this optimized linear transformation. In the end, uh, we have a 2D space defined by Z1, Z2 uh, as a linear, um, linear combination of the selected features, which were um, six of the, the top 10 principal components. Now in the space, a point here is an instance, that's a face. Each face is a point in this 2D space. Blue means the algorithm got good performance and orange means it did not get good performance. Remember that is um, the errors were less than 50% of the average errors of all algorithms. So on the left, we have the footprints or the support vector machine predictions of the footprints for our 2007 algorithm. In the middle is the 2002 existing algorithm. And on the left is a support vector machine. So blue is good. So we can easily get good performance for the instances on the left and not so good for the right. But then over on the right, this other algorithm does well. So our 2007 paper 
was basically saying our algorithm is so much better than everybody else's. But clearly when we, on, that's true on average, on average it is better. But when we crack open the instances and we see them like this, we can see every instance as a point in the 2D space. We can see, ah, actually our algorithm is good for these ones on the left. And another algorithm was good for the ones on the right. And support vector machine was kind of similar to our algorithm. So a lot more detail now is, is possible. When we understand about the left versus the right of the space and what are the characteristics of the faces that live in certain regions, we can look at the distribution of our features, principal components three to eight, and we can see whether or not there's any patterns there. What is the left versus the right defined by? So you have the opportunity to visually scan uh, and try to understand these spaces. And let me just uh, jump to the punchline and tell you that principal component number five correlates with the true age of people quite nicely. So over on the left of the space, we have the babies and the children. And over on the right of the space, we have the older people. And this is the distribution of principal component number five. If you're over here on the left, you have a small value of principal component number five. If you're over on the right, you have a large value of principal component number five with the color scale going from blue to yellow. So I can already see from this visualization that over on the left of the children and over on the right of the older people and our algorithm is particularly good on the children and the young people and not as good as the 2002 algorithm on the right. But on average, we are better. Why is that? Because the database has more young people than old people. And that makes sense, right? When you think about collecting data, you're gonna to go to your lab and you're gonna say, hey, can you send me some photos throughout your life? And you're talking to people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And you're saying, can you send me some photos throughout your life? So you're going to be getting lots of photos of babies and children, teenagers and 20s and 30s. And you're not going to get photos from the future because they're not there yet. And you're not going to have that many people who are in their 70s or 80s that you're asking in a university to send you photos. So you can understand why this database was biased towards younger people. You can understand why when we report performance of algorithms on average, an algorithm like ours, which does particularly well for young faces, looks like it's dominating. Anyway, all of this understanding um, of the characteristics of the face uh, gave us a new idea. That principal component five is pretty powerful. So here's a new algorithm idea. Just take the principal component five value of a face, fit a simple power law function to estimate it. We did that just in Excel and we get this new function. It's a new algorithm that will predict your age based only on principal component number five. Take principal component number five, add one to it, raise it to this power, multiply it by this, subtract 10, here's a number. This is your estimated age. How accurate is it? It gives uh, a pretty competitive performance. It has an absolute error of 7.3 years across the FGNet database. It's not winning, but on average, it's, it's in there with the algorithms that we're focusing on. Um, and there are parts of the space where it's very accurate. So if we have a look at the unique footprint for principal component number five, what you'll immediately notice is that its footprint where it's good is right across the space from the young to the old. Sure, it has a weakness at the top, but it's not left right anymore. We have an algorithm that is good for many different ages. Um, in the lower half where we have high values also of principal component number three and low values of principal component number six. So it gives you an idea for a new algorithm. Why don't we look at principal components three, five, and six and um, pairwise interactions of these things. We've done that. We can get the, the performance even further down, but that's not my point. My point is that these insights can lead to new algorithmic ideas as well. When we combine all of these support vector machines of what's been learned about how algorithms will perform across the space, we can come up with automated algorithm selection where we see that uh, we would use our algorithm over here, we would use uh, principal component five algorithm over here, we would use the 2002 model over here, the support vector machine here, and there's a little gray region in here where none of the support vector machines were particularly confident, um, and maybe we need some more data. But that's automated algorithm selection. So the question then is, uh, were our 2007 conclusions upheld in the light of this new way of analyzing uh, data? Uh, yes, our ages algorithm is best on average, even when we revisited the results, rewrote the code, uh, updated it all, our method was still best on average. 
but that's only because the database that everybody studied back then is biased towards young people. Um, our algorithm had strength on young faces and weakness on older faces. The 2002 algorithm was better for older faces. Sport Vector Machine was similar to our algorithm, but also um, best for the very old faces. These insights uh, that instance space analysis has offered has helped us to create a new algorithm idea that has unique strengths that we can demonstrate. Um, and the limitations of the database and the need for extreme caution when interpreting on average results have been exposed by revisiting this study. Um, so, um, oh, and I should say that, of course, these days people don't use that database. These days there are other um, uh, morph two databases, like tens of thousands of faces and, and the field has, um, has augmented. And of course, we're trying to eliminate bias in all of the benchmark data sets that we all use in many different fields. If you'd like to get started with using some instance space analysis, it's completely free for you to, to um, hit that get, getting started button and create a user account and uh, you can have a go. We're very happy to support you um, in exploring how instance space analysis can help you get more insights into algorithm strengths and weaknesses and stress test your algorithms more rigorously. Uh, so I hope that picture now makes sense. Um, and um, I'm happy, happy to answer questions um, in the online session. Thank you.